Dear Father, I just want to thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us what we don't deserve. Giving us what you don't deserve instead of giving us what we do deserve. I just want to thank you for giving us a promise of being conformed to the image of your son. just want to thank you for that. Um, just want to pray for that message today, which is on that topic. I just want to thank you for that hope. Thank you for that promise. Just with all these things, in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> all right, so what I've drawn here is kind of a map of, well, not kind of a map, a map. So this is Africa here. Okay. This is Israel here. Okay. This is what well, with modern day Turkey here. Okay. This is, let me draw, let me get this anchored with my uh, we have the Sea of Galilee. Okay. Sea of Galilee. And we have uh, the Jordan River, the uh, the Dead Sea. Of course, this is the Red Sea here. Um, this area in here, well, I'm convinced that this is where somewhere in here is where the children of Israel crossed, came in, came into the land, and went to crossed over. And there's Jerusalem, somewhere in there. Okay. So now Paul has begun to travel, okay? So he was up in this area here. Barnabas goes up to this area up in here. This is Antioch. There's two Antiochs spoken of. There's one that's here. There's one that's over here. Barnabas is over here seeing what's going on. He gets sent out from, from the disciples in Jerusalem and says, we hear some things that are going on up there. Go check it out. He sees what's going on, and he goes up to this area and gets Paul. Paul comes down here, and they spend some time there at the church in Antioch. And that's when we first read about the, the Gentile getting the message as well. Okay, That's where we first see that. Now, it's interesting that, that, that uh, Barnabas didn't go back down to headquarters. He actually went up to Paul. Okay. Now, I will say this is much closer than this here, but that's also something because something else is going on here. They're staying in Jerusalem because that was their commission. Okay, Jerusalem first, then outside that area, out, out in the area of uh, Judea, then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, so they were to spread out. Well, they hadn't. It hadn't gone past really Jerusalem they stayed there but because of the heavy persecution the believers those that are in Christ Jewish saints that believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah were actually pushed through persecution they dispersed okay and so many of them wound up here now why did they were they dispersed in the first place a feller by the name of Saul of Tarsus brought such heavy persecution on them that they, they, they went farther and farther and farther. It wasn't they wanted to. They did it because they did it for the safety, because it was getting so difficult. Okay? But the apostles stayed here. Now, we know about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul, whose name is also Paul, or vice versa. Okay? Saul, the Hebrew name. Paul, the Roman name, or the Gentile name. Okay? So now, we, we have this here, and we, we have, when Paul goes out on a missionary journey, okay, there's an area in here, this area here is Galatia, okay, and he has, and there's teaching going on there, and there's, that's, in one of the cities here is when he gets stoned, presumably to death, in, okay, and he stands back up and goes back into the city. Now, coming off of all that, Eventually, he, he, he moves on and he winds up in this area over in here, okay? So, I'm going to start in Acts 16.1. So, this Derby and Lystra, it's somewhere in here, okay? Okay? 
somewhere in that area. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. We know who that is, Timothy. The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra in Iconium. So we have Lystra, Iconium, Derby. It's all in this area, okay? It's all in this area. But that region that surrounds it is the region of Galatia. So when we read the book uh, to the Galatians, we are talking about a region somewhere in here, okay? Just remember that. So it is, so it'd be like we have our local towns, right? And our local cities and our local areas, okay? We have, we have Finland, which is a, it really isn't a town, right? But we talk about it like it's a town, it, it, okay? We're, it's Crystal Bay Township. It's the area of Finland, which can be pretty broad. Sometimes we're zoning right in on that, but sometimes, I mean, way out by Nine Mile Lake, it's like, yeah, you know, I live in Finland. Well, you're not, I mean, what is that, 17 miles or something away from there? Okay. So it's, it's, that's why something of these terms get confusing when they're talking about this area, because we could talk about, we could say, well, you know, when I lived in Finland, I'd say, yeah, I'm, you know, Silver Bay. Well, that's 11 miles away, okay? But I would say that as that. Or sometimes I'd say, well, on the shore, we do this. Well, when I lived in Finland, I wasn't on the shore. Nancy's on the shore. Gail's on the shore, okay? But I wasn't really on the shore. So when we a, a lot of times our Bible reading gets confusing, particularly Old Testament, because they use a term that we would get. Like if I said, well, you know, over on the shore, we, you know, we have a lot of this going on. Well, I could be talking about Finland. I mean, we could even almost consider Isabella that, right? I mean, depending on what you're talking about locally. So, so like I said, just kind of getting familiar with some of the geography of this. So, for instance, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a book of Laodicea. But we have a, a, a region, some writings to be shared about that area. So just kind of some backlog to that. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia. All right, so now they're over in, they're, they're, they're in this region. And were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Messina. So once they had covered this area, they were pretty much so shut down in their ministry. They were forbidden of the Holy Ghost. It says that's the term of it. Now, what that looks like or the reality of it is, I don't really know. Okay? I just take it for granted and say we're forbidden. Just don't teach there. Now, they wind up in an area of Messiah, Mycenae, which is somewhere up in here. Okay? This area in here. They essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And, and they, passing in Messiah, came down to Troas. So we're still in this general area. Okay? Just remember, here's Jerusalem. Okay? They're way over here. This is what we call modern-day Greece. Okay, so they're a long ways away. But this is the Aegean Sea here, separating them. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. Now, this upper area here, this is Macedonia. Okay? At the time, that's known as Macedonia. This is where Alexander the Great came from. Okay? It was this area here. And he ends up going and winding up somewhere over here. Okay. Somewhere over here. So they, 
And after he had seen the vision, verse 10, immediately we endeavored to, to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathered that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with the straight course to, how do you say that word? So what's that? Some Samothraca. And the next day to Neapolis. From thence to Philippi. They wind up here. So they have these other little places that they bop to. By, okay? And then they get to Philippi. Which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. Now what is the chief city? Anybody remember? Chief city of Rome? Chief city is like a miniature Rome. It's Roman, okay? It has Roman customs, Roman rules, okay? Okay? Um, there's, um, I actually, I want to say uh, where Paul comes from, that's a chief city as well, okay? So he's in Philippi. Now, he, here's where he gets some persecution on the end of the Gentiles, Okay? And then from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And they were in that city abiding certain days. Okay, so now, they're there. Now there's a, an, an activity that goes on there in, this, in Philippi. Okay, verse 16. And it came to pass, as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination, met us and brought her masters much game by soothsaying. So if she's a soothsayer, what is he? She's a fortune teller. Okay? And she's good at it. By some supernatural means, see, she could tell the future, and for the right price, you could get the right information. The same followed Paul with and us, and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the most high God, which showeth the way to salvation. And she did this many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, masters, right? She's owned by multiple people. She's apparently very valuable that they actually have stockholders. Okay, got a partnership in this. When that gain, their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them in the marketplace and the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews, where? In a chief city that is a Roman city, a miniature Rome, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent out their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now what was the real reason they were mad at them? Their profit margin went in the plummeted, right? Because all of a sudden, this woman lost her power through, because the Spirit left her. Why? Because Paul, by the power of Almighty God, told the Spirit to leave. So here, to, the, so the Spirit obeyed and left. So now we've got a regular old woman, just like any other woman, in their powers anyway. And so she can't tell the future. But want to see what happened here? All right, now we've got this problem going on here. And so we need to deal with this. It has nothing to do with about teaching customs. It has to do with everything really about is, is that her powers left. She lost her powers. Now he commanded it in the name of Jesus Christ, didn't he? Teaching custom, that, that teaching, that was a teaching ministry. Here, look, you leave, you know, I command you by the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? What's, what's the moral to the story? What did they learn? That there's power in that name. And there's a power in that ministry. 
So then they beat them and they incarcerated them. Okay? So now we have the we have what we know about the Philippian, we have the incident of the Philippian jailer and the doors being thrown open and, and the jailer is gonna he's gonna commit suicide because that's better than being held accountable to Rome. Right? If he can just end his life, then I don't have to go through everything now I'm gonna go through losing everybody. And what does Paul tell him? But Paul, verse 28, But Paul cried in a loud voice, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and spring. So now picture this. You have a prison full of prisoners. And they're singing praises to the Lord. And all of a sudden, the doors fly open and the chains fall off. Well, what would be the normal thing to think? Jailbreak. And Paul called and cried, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he, the jailer, called for a light and sprang in, came drum, trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. All right. The stronghold broke. Broke so obviously and completely that something incredible is going on. Fell down before Paul and Silas. And brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Now, personally, I think that this jailer has more of a connection to the Jewish religion than what's actually stated here. Okay? Because what likely language were they speaking and what were they singing in and amongst and all these things like that? And all of a sudden he says, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Well, there must have been some doctrine because he figured he was doomed. Think about that. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, what I want to really get into here is, so that's the area of Philippi. Okay? So there's Gentile persecution there. Chapter 17. Now we know the rest of the story, and they're eventually released. Why? Anybody know why they were released? There really wasn't anything that they were guilty of, right? Did they lay a finger on anybody? No. Did they? Did they? Talk bad about Caesar? No. They didn't do anything like that. But they're also Romans, both who? Paul and Silas. A lot of people don't catch that one. But Silas also being Romans. So now, you've incarcerated somebody illegally. A Roman citizen. You've beaten a Roman citizen with no cause. Verse 37, But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly uncondemned. We were never charged with anything. We were never judged of anything. We were just beaten. Being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeant told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard they were Romans. And when they came, they brought them, besought them, and brought them out, and desired that they part out of the city. Please go. Now, I, I do read between the lines. It wouldn't have taken very much for two Romans to bring that up to the next level and really put those guys in trouble, right? But they didn't. They just left. Okay? But just think of the trouble that that could happen to somebody. I mean, that could be, that could actually be their position or their neck for doing this. Now, Chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphilip... Amphil ah. 
Amphipolis and Apollonia, there we go, and came to Thessalonica, there was a synagogue of the Jews. So we have a couple of cities are right along the way. So he goes through the two A's, and he winds up, whoop, I messed that up. I'm almost all the way out of uh, Macedonia here. They hit a city, they hit another city, and then they're over here. So this area here, there's the Thessalonica. Okay, they were here, boom, boom, boom. The next, there's another area after there, that's Berea, okay, right there. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So for three weeks, at least on the Sabbath day, he actually took over the show in the synagogue. And he's explaining what? Jesus Christ is the anointed of God. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, okay, Isaiah 53, and risen from the dead, Psalm 110, and that this Jesus who, or Psalm 22, well, all of them, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you is Christ, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks grew a multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So what do we see here? We see it just started out of the synagogue, and it went Greeks in the synagogues, either Greeks that were in the synagogue, Greek Jews. But then all of a sudden we have chief women, not a few. So what do we start seeing here? We see a mixed gallery. But the Jews which believed not. Now this is going to be a constant theme in Paul's ministry from here on out. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. Well, I shouldn't say it already started back here. What happened? Here's where Paul got beat, right? Okay. Why did he get beat? Why did, did, were Gentiles known for stoning people? No, he got stoned by his kinsmen. Because he's alleging that Jesus Christ is what? The Messiah of Israel. Okay? And they beat him for it. Now he winds up over here, and now we have this, we have this other issue as well. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. What does that mean? We're talking about the most unscrupulous, bottom of the barrel, they'll do anything for a buck. Okay? I mean, you know among criminals we have like a code of conduct? Some criminals will only go so low. These guys could give a rip less. Okay? Whatever. Ha! <laughs> Good enough. Okay? These guys are guilty of nothing. They haven't done anything. They've done nothing, you know, so it's, it's kind of like Today would be, let's say someone posts something on Facebook. And they said, the Bible says this. And then somebody in your neighborhood didn't like it. So then with enough influence and power, got some people to accuse you of doing something that you didn't do that is chargeable by crime and getting everybody riled up against you just to get you to shut up or get you out of here. Okay? 
That's essentially what's going on here. He's saying the Bible says this, the Bible says this, the Bible says this. This guy did this, this guy did this, this guy did this. He fulfilled the scripture. He is what the scriptures have been talking about. Here's his pedigree. Here's his history. And he gets put into. So now these get, get, the, get the town, area, region riled up. Okay? And they're riled up. Basically created a riot. Okay, now, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar, assaulting the house of Jason. Now, the house of Jason is the house where they were staying. So now there's, there's a mob outside the house there, you know, throwing tomatoes and whatever, and they're going to get them. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down and are come hither also. So what do we have a combination of here? So we have Jews that believe not, hiring lewd fellers of the baser sort, okay, the, the scum of the earth, to rile up the town, to basically, by mob, Bring these guys out and get rid of them. Eliminate them. So then when they didn't find them in the house, so then they bring the older of, owner of the house and said, these are, well, this is part of the problem. This person here, he housed them. These that have turned the world upside down and come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and all these do contrary to the degrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. So what do we have here? We have a combination of Jew and Gentile ideas colliding. Okay? Now, if a Jew were being honest, they would say, yeah. If they were going to quote the scripture, they would talk about the seed of David, and then say, yeah, there will be another king. The question or not really whether is that if this guy is the king. And so Paul's testifying and proving that Jesus Christ is that king. And so now what are they doing? Well, there's another ruler besides the ultimate ruler who is Caesar. Caesar is a, is a god, according to them. Now, and when they had taken security of Jason and the other, they let him go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea. They were looking for him. And the brethren said, you guys got to get out of here. So they sent him over to another town over here. They sent him to Berea. Okay. Now here's the difference, at least between the synagogue of, 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 in Thessalonica and the synagogue and the Jews in Berea. This is that the Jews in Berea actually looked and said, does this compare with the scripture? Okay? Now, verse 11. These, the Bereans, okay? That's where the Berean searchlight, okay, gets their name from. These were more no noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the world word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they hear the idea. It says the scripture says, here's this. And they say, all right, does this cross-reference out? Now it's, and they actually looked and said, well, gee, the Bible says this, and they're actually giving it a fair cross-reference. Okay, it isn't just nope, nope, nope. Didn't come from my pastor. Didn't come from my church. Didn't come from my, my you know, my my minister. Didn't come from my this or that. It was well, gee, you know what? We should be looking at this. We should actually consider this. Okay. Now that's why kind of that that name is kind of stuck in saying you know what? We ought to consider these things. Look at this. Look at that. We should be looking to the scripture rather than going, nope, nope, it's not in my tradition. Nope, nope, couldn't possibly be so. Why is that? Well, I'm not sure, but it can't be. Okay? 
and they're actually looking in their Bible, okay, which is what we would call the what? The Old Testament, okay? Now, therefore many of them believed. Why did they believe? Because it checked out with the Bible. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks and men, not a few. Same line almost exactly as verse 4. Talking about were Greeks and of men, women, Greeks, men. So we have a mixed multitude believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of Israel and that he's raised from the dead. Verse 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. So it wasn't enough for them just to turn this down into uproar and basically get Paul shipped out. Paul winds up over here, and guess what? It's taking off there. And when, when those of Thessalonica here, what do they do? They follow him over there to cause a problem there. All right. Now, you have a combination of Jew and Gentile persecution nonetheless. Yes, no doubt. But who is the ones pursuing him? The Jews. The Jews. His brethren. His kinsmen. I mean, it's not enough just to say, you know, whatever they do over there, that's fine and dandy. It doesn't affect me. I know it's wrong. Nope. We're going to get them over there. And they follow him along. Now, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. Then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But si Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens. Now Paul is down Somewhere in here, okay? So he's been here, been here, 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 here. Winds up down here, okay? Now, he's in Athens. And he's there, he, he, he's left Silas, and Timotheus, Timothy, back in Berea. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So he gets there, and he sends out to go get these guys. Okay? Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens... His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So when he said the whole city given wholly to idolatry, my assumption is, is that that's including his Jewish brethren too. That's mixed into it, if the whole city is. So he starts in the synagogue. He goes in the synagogue, and he's preaching to them, and he's teaching them, and then he, he's dealing also with uh, devout persons. That would be, I would, my assumption would be, is, is that those are those believe in the Creator, okay? And in the market daily with them that met with them. So he'll talk with anybody, Jew, Gentile, anyone that'll listen. Then we run into a certain couple of groups, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now these are, we have our groups, right? We have our different entities that we're kind of aligned with. And these two groups, and they have one thing in common. They're like, listen to what this guy is saying. He's saying something new. He's saying something different. Now, he ends up on Mars Hill, as we call it, or Aeropagus. Okay, and I've talked about this before. Now, Aeropagus... Ares is the son of Zeus. 
So in Greek mythology, Zeus is the father. What is Ares? The son. Okay? So he winds up on the hill that's owned by the son of the father. Then he's going to tell you about the son of the father. The real father and the real son. Okay? And he goes and explains that to them. So I, the irony of God, that, that to me, I, God has a sense of humor, I'm quite convinced. So he, because he puts him in a situation. He's in this situation where he's actually on the hill, owned by the Son of God, speaking about the Son of God. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive ye all to be too superstitious. The religious guy is talking about them being superstitious. I told my cousin that. I said, I'm not superstitious. I said, and I'm not religious. And she just, her jaw just about fell open. Okay? She couldn't believe I said that. I'm not religious. Because in her idea, religious is a belief. Okay? What I showed her is that a religion is something you do. Something you practice. I just believe this. Okay? Whether I'm teaching or not, or whether we're together or not, has no bearing of what I just believe. I just believe this. I don't have to do anything. I just believe what the book says. Now, if believing something is religious, well, then everybody is religious. Because everybody believes something, right? If you believe the sun's going to rise tomorrow, well, then you're religious by that definition, right? If you believe that night's going to come after that, then you're religious because you believe that something's going, you know, that something's going to happen. No, I just believe that this is going to happen. Your Bible is not a religion. Your Bible contains a religion called Judaism. There was something to be done. Why? So that you could be sanctified or the, that, the, the group that he was dealing with, which was the children of Israel, could be set aside, sanctified, and be, so that they could be holy before God to do a purpose. And they had a mechanism of dealing with their problems. God did that not because he liked it, but he had to create a means for it because men are sinners. Women are sinners. Mankind is sinners. So he put a religion in it to, in order to get them back right with God and bring them one together. We call that at one meant. At tone meant. Okay? To bring the two back together. Okay? So that man and God are reconciled. Okay? If I have an argument with my wife and we are separated, we are, there is a division in between us. Somebody is offended by the other. Okay? Until we come back together and both groups are satisfied, we are not reconciled. We're still apart. Then we, when both parties come together, we are now reconciled. We are at one meant, atonement. There is atonement. Now, in order between mankind and God to come back together, there was a means that was done. Okay? There was something that was done by another to bring them together. Now, what we know today is that these are all pictures of Jesus Christ. Okay? We have Abram... Uh, not, not Abram. We have Aaron going into the, the tabernacle, and he's putting blood, flicking the blood on the mercy seat. And he's doing that seven times. Why? That's to cover the sins of the people. We have the sacrificial system. They are slaying a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the evening. Why? Just because of the continual sin that's going on there. That's what God's doing it to bring them back together. Okay? We have individuals bringing their own sacrifices. I've offended Almighty God. I know I have. Because I broke what he told me to do. I haven't done it. I haven't followed it. And I would bring this sacrifice to make an atonement to bring God and I back together. Now there was always a means. Do you understand that? There was always something that was done. Okay? One time, the plague has started in, 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 in the nation of Israel. 
okay? And it's wiping people all left and right. And Moses tells Aaron, he says, go burn incense and put a line between the people. And you know what? That plague is just coming across. It hit that wall and it, it acknowledged it and it quit. Now what is that incense? What, are those, what does that smoke represent? Prayers of the saints. A prayer can make intercession. Now, does Jesus Christ make intercession for you? Yes. So God recognizes that, right? All right? Now, did Jesus Christ bleed for you? Yes. Did he die for you? Yes. So you see all these things? Was he raised for you? Yes. Where is he at? He's next to the right hand. He's on the right hand of the Father. Boom. Where are you? Right there. Are you at one meant with God? Yes. Okay. Do I have a verse that would help me with that one there? When we come to Ephesians. Oh. Romans doesn't look anything like Ephesians. Well, yeah, I want to lead into it. Verse 13, chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What is that? Back up to verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he had purposed himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. That's the hope. That's the promise. That Holy Spirit of promise that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, sometime in the future, the gathering of all things in heaven and earth. Verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The dispensation of the fullness of times, gathering together all things in one. Chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together in Christ. Verse 6. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Okay? Right now, if you're in Christ, as far as God's concerned, you're seated in heavenly places. Okay? Now, back to Acts chapter 17. Paul is on, he's in Athens, he's on the hill owned by the Son of God, talking about God and talking about the Son of God. Verse 29, Acts 17, 29. For then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone. That was the issue in Athens. Is the idols, the figurines. Right? They, they, you know, they look at the statue. Okay? And they say, there's God. It's like, no, it's not. 
This piece of stone. All right? You bow down to this piece of stone. Verse 30, and the times of this ignorance God winked at. Wink, wink. Ha, ha. But you know what? He's done winking. But now commandeth every man everywhere to repent. What? Change your mind about that statue being your God. It's just a dumb idol. It can't speak. Why? Why does he want them to know? Why has he commanded them to know? Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man he, whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. Do you have to be afraid of a dead guy? If my worst enemy that's going to get me my biggest foe, but he dies? Do I have to be worried about that enemy anymore? No. He's dead. I outlived him. My danger from him is gone, right? Think about this, logistically, honestly. But Paul's saying he's alive, right? The testimony is he's raised from the dead. Is the threat still there? Yes. Okay? He's talking about the returning of the Lord. He's talking about the Lord pouring out judgment, which is negative. You see all the wrong things going on. You see it in your community. You see it in your state. You see it in your nation. You see it in your, your continent. You see it in your world. You go, Doug, sometimes I get down over that. Sometimes I do. But what helps me with that in the injustice, I mean, we can talk. Who likes seeing an innocent victim just get picked on? I mean, bad wise. I mean, you think of the awful things that have gone on. Okay? Nobody should. Okay? The terrible, awful things that have gone on, gone on, gone on, gone on. It hasn't gone away. The record is there. Okay? It accumulates. How do I know that? Anybody think of a Bible verse? Come with me to Romans chapter 2. Verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God, for as many, the group, okay, the whole group, as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. And their thoughts the mean. That's the measuring device, right? While accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. In the day. Judgment. Back up to verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, it's a non-repentant heart, meaning it's not, it's not going to change. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure, treasure us up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. 
That's doom and gloom. As it should be. That's what it's meant to be. So here's Paul speaking on the hill owned by the Son of God, talking about what God has done to the Son and how he's given him the authority. Acts 17, verse 31. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Judgment. By the man he raised from the dead. That's the point. So why do we need to know about this? God gives everyone the opportunity to avoid that. The day of wrath. Now, if he's preaching that down here, okay, in Athens, why would I think he's teaching something different? Right? Why would I? I think this is just a great example of him doing it right here. So we have judgment. Now, that judgment is by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember we were in Thessalonica back up here? Okay, not long before that. Let's come to the book of Thessalonians. This is actually where I'm going to next. I just kind of want to hit some high points in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians. Likely, these were some of the earliest books, letters written or the, the, uh, by Paul. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, what does it say in verse 10? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which what? Delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, doesn't that sound like what he was warning the, 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 the Athenians on Mars Hill? Judgment's coming by the sun. Now, what does 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 lead me to believe? I'm delivered from the wrath to come. Who delivered us? Who's the us? The believing Thessalonians. The believing Thessalonians, who he was there shortly before he came down to here. Come with me to chapter 2. Verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Who's the joy? Who's the crown? Believers. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye? You are. Ye, the group, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, for ye are our glory and joy. Converts, members of the body of Christ. Chapter 3. Verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father. At the when? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What's the purpose? What's the point? To establish your hearts. 
unblameable, to stabilize, make it unmovable, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, so that what is there talking about the, the, the information here? It's to stabilize them so that they don't, they don't have to be moved from the doctrine. They don't have to be afraid of his coming. Okay? That's the reason for the letter, is to have some concrete some information that doesn't change. It isn't, well, I don't think he really said that, or I don't remember that that's what he said. We can go back and we can read it. And we've been doing that for thousands of years now. Okay? Then we get into chapter 4. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore... Comfort one another with these words. Do you have to be afraid of the coming of the Lord? No. Okay. Do non-believers have to be afraid of the coming of the Lord? They should be. What do they got to do to not be afraid of it? Get in Christ. Right? Now, if they are in Christ, but they're afraid of the coming of the Lord because they're confused, what's this letter for? Exactly. Make that heart rock solid and say, no way, I don't have to be afraid of that. The, how about chapter 5? Chapter 5. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body. All three parts of you and me. Right? Be preserved blameless unto the what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This whole letter, the topic is what? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Okay? Now, we've got other information in there, but it's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but as long as we're in chapter 5 here, back up to verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by what? By our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So should, if, if this is true, then there's the information. End of story. End of argument. Right? Now, let's go back to Chapter 1. You've got chapter 1. Actually, when we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm just going to read something from there. Start in chapter 2, verse 13. Second Colonians, chapter 2, verse 13. Well, let's, yeah, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God. Always mean fully, right? For you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, 
You know what it is to mean to be beloved? To be loved, beloved of the Lord. That is to be blessed, to be happy, beloved of the Lord. You're the beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. What's the means? Belief. belief of the truth. How does it work? Sanctifying the Spirit. Why? Because my body stinks. My body's rotten. My body is the sin that dwells in my members. So what do I need? I need the sanctification of the Spirit to preserve me until when? That day. That day. How did he, how did I get into this? Verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel. Who is our? Second Thessalonians starts off with Paul, Silvanus, Timotheus. Okay? Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And he says, our gospel. The message that they're bringing forth, he called the what? The Thessalonians with a message. Wherein to, back to chapter, chapter 2, verse 14, wherein he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught whether by word or our epistle. Now, he tells them to hold fast to the traditions, right? Are we to hold fast to the traditions? No, Paul didn't teach us. We just have the word. So my tradition might be wrong. Okay? Traditionally, I thought that before I took the little communion glass and ate the little communion cracker, that I thought that's how I dealt with my personal sin. Okay? I learned that within the Lutheran church. That's what I thought. Because every time before we would take it, we would have, we would, the, the preacher would quote 1 John 1, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, and he'd say that right before he'd break the bread and drink his chalice, and then we'd come up there and get our thimble full of wine and wafer, right? It's stuck to the roof of your mouth every time. Okay. <laughs> you know, Jer. <laughs> Almost as bad as venison tallow. My point is, is that that was my tradition in the past. Okay? We weren't taught directly by Paul. They were. He set them up. He got them established. Okay? He started the churches there through the message. He and, uh, and Silas and Timothy were doing the work of the ministry... And they've got these things going. Then they, that he had to leave. He had to leave because of persecution, quite frankly. Okay, and the brethren shipped him off and said, here, you just go. We'll take care of things back home here. Okay, so then he winds up in Athens. And when he's in Athens, he's like, you guys got to come down here. We need, there's a, there, this, this whole city needs help. I need help in the ministry. And he actually calls them out of, his, of, of some churches that are set out. He said, send them down here. I need help getting this thing going. I can't do it all by myself, apparently. But in the meantime, what does he start doing? He warns them of the pending judgment, the future that's coming. So now, he tells them to hang on to the traditions. 
We don't have any traditions from Paul orally. All we have is the completed word, which is totally adequate. If it were not adequate, we would see prophets in our midst. But the whole idea of the forming of the body of Christ was, I, I gave the analogy of a child developing in its mother. Okay? Now that became, gave, was given life the moment it was fertilized. But it needed an environment and it needed a certain surroundings in order to let its development grow. And, when, and all of a sudden, this thing is being built, and it's this, this cluster begins to turn into shape of things that are actually doing a job and taking care of responsibility. All these things that take care of responsibility. Now, every single cell has the road map inside of it. Every single one of us here has the Bible right here. Right? We have what it looks like. But we all just fill in natural areas that are just what they are in our ministry, our own personal ministries. Okay? And the more mature you become in the word, the more profitable you become in something. Okay? And that's just how this works. So we, the body of Christ, if you describe it like a child, when, it was in, when, when Paul was in Thessalonica and in Athens and when all these different places... We're actually just giving life to an organism in an area. And then it starts growing, and now it actually gets to the point where, it has to, where, where it's beginning to stand on its own two feet. It just needs a little bit of help. So it has, it has teachers and preachers and prophets and helps and all these other things. Does that make sense? So when we get to this, He's now writing a letter back to them, which is part of an instruction manual, which is going to be of a bigger instruction manual, which is a part of 13 sections of our instruction manuals for pertaining to the body of Christ today in the period of the dispensation of the grace of God. So we have this book, that, that sustains us, that we access the information. Before this book was completed, they needed additional help. That's why we don't see the miracles. That's why we don't see those things. There is no need for it. We are a self-sustaining body as it's been going on for 2,000 years. Now, some of us function better than others. Okay? And that's been going on. But nonetheless, this... You know what? Believers preserve this book. How? Just by, because it's that important. At great risk. At danger. Okay? Bloody Mary. It's a red drink, right? Why was she called Bloody Mary? Because of the persecution of the Bible believers that rejected the Catholic Church. All right? And she waged war on them. That's why she, that's why nicknamed Bloody Mary. Hence the name of the red drink that looks like blood. Okay? You just, just think about it. Why, reason why we have this book today is people at great cost, great danger, preserved it. That's one part of the ministry. You know what one part of the ministry could be? I had it in my house. I didn't do anything, but I had it in my house, and I had it so it could be so it could be preserved for later. That's one part of the ministry. They would have tore apart your house, and they would have found it. You were doomed. You might not have copied it, but you had it. Why? Because it's important. Because someone in the else could need it. That's. See the work of the ministry? Why am I here? Why was Ron here? Okay. Why was the milkman doing his job calling out people by a what? Gospel. In a new town that never existed before. Okay. 
Why? Because it's important. Now, so when I talk about things in the ministry, it's not necessarily in the things right here. Is part of it here? Sure. Sure it is. Take care of the responsibilities. But the prime objective is, is to learn and grow so that you can function in this world. Now, the warnings that he gives throughout is that there's things to separate yourself from. And he actually sets it up and he gives some commandments for them to do. It's pretty simple. Abstain from fornication. That's one of them. Okay? Gives them other information. And we're going to continue on, but I wanted to get this intro in, in the book of Thessalonians. But we're in, uh, we're in sec- Second uh, Thessalonians. Come with me to chapter 1, verse 5. Now understand, in, in the region of Thessalonica, they're getting persecuted, hired by their own, by their own people. Okay? So in 2 Thessalonians, for that message, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of our God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. They're getting beat on hard. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Because they're getting persecuted, he said, well, here's it being manifest that the judgment of God is going to happen. You're saying something that's causing them to hate you and causing them to do things to you for just saying something. Not saying, I'm going to get you. No. You're saying, God's going to judge the ungodly. You have the opportunity to miss it. You have the opportunity to be in Christ, to be in the one that died for your sins that was raised from you, raised for you. Now, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Coming here singing sonnets. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So. There's the warning that he's given. There's the message that he is presenting. So we'll pick it up on that next week. So. Dear Father, I just want to thank you for saving us from the wrath to come, giving us a hope, giving us a promise, promise us in a, 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 not only a redeemed soul, but a redeemed body. I just want to thank you for that promise. I just want to thank you for all these things that are made possible by, by the effort of the Godhead through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.